Yeah, my name is Jim Melander. I'm, uh, I'm retired, actually, from uh, LBL, but they keep me hanging around. I've been hanging around for about five years. And fortunately, in my position, I have the opportunity to just like research interesting things. And in particular, what I've been working on recently is how can Zeek be made to run faster without code changes? But just maybe we'll see. How fast can it run? So the goals are, we'll just talk about what the quest for efficiency in computing has been over the years. And can Zeek run faster without code changes? Maybe trying a different compiler? Maybe using some different libraries, benchmarks, and suggestions. Now, I was born in 1956, the same year that Fortran 1 came out. This was even before subroutines. But they considered it important enough. I don't know if you can read that, but they had a frequency statement in the original Fortran so that you could actually specify the frequency that different branches would take. Now, that was very important. You know, especially back then, uh, systems were much slower. In fact, the IBM 650, a real early one, had a drum memory. And so it was really important that when one instruction executed, when it finished, you wanted the next instruction coming over the read head so that it would be as fast as possible, which by our standards, of course, is a snail's pace. So this is uh, back in 1956. It was important back then, it's important now. Now, modern code optimization, the compiler has to make some decisions. You know, in a branch, because of the uh, caching and all that, it used to be before, before caching, of course, that a branch taken was pretty much the same as a branch not taken. But nowadays, with, with cache uh, lines being filled, you probably want to have the, the straight line code executed as frequently as possible. So is, is the then condition more probable than the else? Also, compilers inline functions, right? Or should it unroll a loop? For instance, if you have a loop of 1 to 10, maybe you don't need a counter counting to 10, but you put, that, put those instructions in 10 times. That creates an efficiency gain at the cost of extra memory. The questions mainly get down to branch probability, though, right? Which are used by heuristics. A loop exit condition, you know, you're usually going to predict a loop of a certain amount of time. Eventually, of course, that's going to exit, but you're going to usually estimate that that's not going to be true, that it's going to be false. So there are several ways to optimize code branches manually. The frequency statement that I discussed which was actually very advanced. They actually use a Monte Carlo method with the frequency statement to estimate which direction the program was going to go. Very advanced for its time. Now, GCC has a built-in expect function where you can actually tell the compiler, I expect the branch to go this way or that way. And, um, it's used in micro, uh, macros, likely and unlikely, that are actually used in a Linux kernel. And they're used quite frequently. And it's made tremendous performance increases. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a presentation at Brocon where someone was using these likely and unlikely macros and got a 3% increase in the speed of Zeek, or Bro at the time. And I was intrigued, but it kind of went into the back of my mind. But then when I had some free time, I kind of picked it up. Well, the GCC manual, that looks like it was written by Stallman probably, 
Programmers are notoriously bad at predicting how their programs actually perform. So what does that mean? That means that you know, we don't want to rely on our own noggins to, to figure that out. We would prefer that the computer figure that out. And obviously, the easiest way is to actually measure which direction these branches went. And then um, take the statistics and use that to recompile your program, taking into advantage of those gathered statistics so that the compiler can optimize the code path. Now, let's see here. Let's see if I can switch to, that doesn't work all the time. For, for instance, you have a one instruction here on an ARM platform that actually executes that, that C statement there. So in this case, though, it doesn't really need to be optimized because it's one instruction anyway, right? But I thought that was interesting. Mainly I'm talking about Intel here, but, and in fact, uh-oh, we're having a, can we switch to that maybe? Oops, okay, here we go, we're making progress. Let's go to the next one. Oops. Okay, this is a t totally synthetic code, wouldn't be something you would use in production, but it's just for, for an example. Uh, you're looking at a TCP flag, maybe it's SYN, FIN, ACK, or you, know, you can have a switch statement or you can have a bunch of ifs. They're not exactly the same for a number of reasons. Um, in particular, if you have a small universe of cases in the switch statement, you can use a jump table rather than than um, nested if statements. But this is one way you could, you could take something like that. Now, oops, let's move on here. Any questions? By the way, if you have a question, just let me know. I probably won't be able to see you because these bright lights, but please uh, ask your question. Now, let's move forward here. Okay, so programmers are notoriously bad at predicting how their programs will perform. But I think uh, if you've looked at network traffic, everyone's gonna say ACK is probably the most common flag that you're gonna see pretty clearly. So if you wanted to manually optimize this, what would we do? We would, we would say, is it not equal to ACK? And then branch around and then the straight line code would process that flag. Why would you do that? That's so that you avoid cache misses, so you avoid unnecessary branching. You want the uncommon case to be out of the main line. So this is how you would do it manually, which is crazy. I mean, this would drive you crazy even trying to accomplish this, right? Doesn't make any sense trying to do that. People would, uh, we got enough pressure on us, right, doing programming. So automated optimization, AKA profile guided optimization. This is used on all modern compilers. So you compile the code with hooks. Now you don't have to add those hooks yourself, but it you know, does it. Gathering statistics on the branches, taken or not taken. You run it against sample input, which gathers the statistics. Then the code is recompiled. using those, those statistics to optimize the, the branches. So here we go. Who uses this? Actually, this is used in production in some major programs. Firefox, you can compile Firefox. It has a compile option where it'll actually do profile guided optimization, which means they have a, a set of what they consider representative uh, web traffic that it runs against it and then you know, you'll get page rendering. Also, of course, Chrome. Python has a mode for that. And so does PHP. Very, very interesting. I, you know, I don't know if these are used in major, major distributions or not, but it'd probably be a good idea to, for them to think about that. 
Zeke, question mark? Why not? So here's the Cliff Notes version. When you compile, you use a coverage flag. I don't know why I say run the binary and then run your application benchmark against it. That doesn't make sense. So skip the second line there. Um, run your application against that binary, uh, which would be, in the case of Zeek, right, representative traffic, maybe network traffic, maybe PCAPs, whatever you think is representative. And then the profile use command, when you recompile it, will use those statistics that are gathered, and then guess what? It runs faster, and we're gonna look at that. Maybe I'll slow down or talk some more. One or the other. Okay, so here's a typical compile. Uh, you build with O2 optimization if you just do a standard build. Now that second bullet point was surprising to me when I found that out. You usually think, well, I'm gonna put these flags in and that's gonna opt, that's gonna override the default flags, but in fact it, it doesn't. It's either a bug or a feature. But then the bottom line, if you say build type equals release, and then build it, then you get O3 optimization, which is, which is a bit better. So to compile, now this is gonna take a lot of explanation, this slide. So there's the first uh, thing that we talked about, using the coverage flag to do your, your configuring and building. Then you run Zeek against the sample input, right, which is gonna be either PCAPs or network. I would recommend also, of course, network traffic as well as PCAPs because you wanna exercise your network code, right? Now that third bullet point, there are these files that will be dropped in that are GCDA and GCNO files. Those are the extensions. And one of those, some of those files are pre-execution, others are post-execution, and they're used for gathering the statistics. So you're gonna, you're gonna capture those, then the fourth bullet point, we clear the source tree, start over, then use these flags. Profile use, profile correction, what's that? Well, profile correction is that, uh, turns out this, let me get a drink of water, this whole uh, profile guided optimization, it's not totally a mature technology. In this case, it's not uh, thread safe. So um, the statistics get kind of wonky in multi-threaded programs such as Zeek. Oh, what happens is, before I found out about that, you actually get, well, let's see, I took this branch 100,000 times, but I only executed it 50 times. You know, well, what does that make? What's going on here? Or be negative. And so I was kind of thinking, well, is that a 32-bit, you know, you're, over, you're overflowing a 32-bit counter so it turns negative. And then I'm thinking, no, they couldn't use a 32-bit counter because modern code, you're gonna have a lot more than 32 bits. Anyway, it's 64 bits, the counter, but because it's multi-threaded, you have to do that correction there. And that last one, minus FLTO, is link time optimization. I don't really know a lot about that. It's, my understanding is that the, uh, let, me, let me think for a second. So it treats all of the object files as, be, as being in one compile unit. So, so for instance, instead of just compiling each part of, of Zeek separately, it's like it was huge, humongous, command line to compile it all, and that way it can optimize a bit more. So C flags are for the C part of the code, 
and CXX, of course, is for the uh, C++. You run configure. Then you want to untar that file that you made, which actually drops the statistic files into the build tree. Then make, make install, you know, standard stuff. So let's see how we did. So I use this 150 gig PCAP. Got a system with CentOS 7.5. The default compiler is GCC 485. So running against that. Oh, and I'm just using the straight local.bro or local.zeek now. No modifications whatsoever. So this is, this is just out of the box. So the first run before using this profile guided optimization, well, we got 2231 and now we're down to 1965, a 12% increase. That's starting to look okay already, right? Well, so then I was researching a bunch of different compilers. Well, 9.2 is in release, 10 is in development of GCC, CLang, Intel Parallel Studio. From Intel, you can get a 30-day uh, uh, trial, or you can pay them big bucks if you want to go past that. Uh, and then AMD has their compiler. Now, they will compile for the, for the opposite platform. So Intel will compile for AMD, and AMD will compile for Intel, but it won't be optimized. Right, it's just gonna be generic. So AMD also has Open64, which is based on an old SGI compiler. And then Portland Group has a compiler that's used on HPC a lot. Uh, we used it at NERSC quite frequently. And there's actually a community edition that you can download too. So I downloaded all of these, I, I tried them all, and by the way, it takes, a, it takes a lot of hacking to actually make them work, and most of them didn't work. I mean, I, 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 I had to, actually I made a script that actually, okay, try compiling with, with one of these, and then if that doesn't work, then compile with GCC. And that was, that was like my compiler driver script that I used. Uh, Anyway, long story short, most of those I gave up on. Um, when I tried GCC 10, which is, just has weekly snapshots now, uh, it was a little wonky. So I went to the release of 9.2. And that's, that's what the rest of this presentation's about. So 9.2, so just compiling it with 9.2, Profile guided optimization, we're 20% faster than when we started just by changing compilers using a more modern compiler. GCC 485 is from uh, about five years old, I guess, four years old, something like that. Well, you know, in my ongoing quest to find something even, even better, how are we doing on time here? Okay, I better press on. So you can do mArch equals native and compile it. So that compiles just for that, you know, the host that you're, um, you're on. So now we're 22% faster than where we started. Well, let's keep going here. Now, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, of malloc, if you've done any kind of programming in C in particular. Uh, I was introduced to that back uh, original K&R book. They had like a one-page implementation of it. And I actually tried it. I had to hack on it a bit. I uh, had to put some thread-safe stuff in there. But anyway, the malloc library is used for dynamic memory allocation um, you know, and Zeek has to allocate stuff every packet, right? And in script interpretation and all of that. So, you know, so I was thinking, well, 
what if we, what if we use an additional, an alternate malloc? And boy, everyone has come up with one. There's tons of them out there. Uh, CentOS, which is based on uh, PT malloc, that's the standard one. Now those two after that, TC malloc and JE malloc are actually the Zeek uh, configure script lets you configure them. So you can try those. Uh, let's see, hey, does this, how's this pointer work? There we go. Okay. For some reason I'm looking in this direction mainly. But the lockless malloc, uh, that's like a guy that, uh, he's got a one-man band and uh, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that one in particular. It seems to be very, very good. Uh, here's another one that's on GitHub Liblite. This is pronounced me malloc, and it's from, according to Microsoft, it's from Microsoft Research. Uh, here's super malloc, another one on GitHub. It actually supports, you know, the latest, uh, latest architectures actually have transactional memory. You know, so if you're like a database person, I mean, you know about transactions and all that. Where, and that allows you to do transactions in, in memory such that you don't have to do locking when, you, when, you're, when you're doing stuff in critical code. So that's kind of a win for the future, presumably. And then I tried OpenBSD. They, someone ported it, oops, pushed the wrong button. OpenBSD, someone ported that to Linux, so I was trying that. It actually has, as part of the OpenBSD dis distribution for their malloc, you actually, it actually distributes RC4 with that because they use crypto, you know, because they're really into the high security. Anyway, we're gonna go on with that. I'll discuss that a little bit later. So here we go, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, JE malloc, TC malloc, lockless malloc, me malloc. The bad was a standard malloc, super malloc, liblite malloc. OpenBSD malloc really was, was slow. And you know what, I even had to hack. I hacked on it so that instead of using RC4 for crypto, I just said, well, I'll just throw in the standard RAND function and we'll see how that works because I'm not looking for like super high crypto here. But that's after I hacked on it to hopefully speed it up. And even so, you can see it didn't turn out too well. But we do have some impressive improvements here. We're down to like LL Malik 1409 from 1744. Now let's, let's keep going. But wait, there's more. How about mArch equals native again? Goes down even more, in some, in some cases those went up, which was kind of strange. My interpretation is that, you know, compiler technology is evolving, right? Evolving. And, um, you know, something that uh, I believe that it's not entirely nailed down what the most efficient code path to do in some cases is. So that's probably my interpretation why that would be uh, an issue there. So let's, let's keep going. Even more. <laughs> so then I recompiled the malloc library with GCC 9.2 and used profile guided optimization against that library. And wow, that one LL Alec went down to 1294, which was 42% speed increase. Now, I'm a little concerned about that one because it uses more memory. Uh, where, I, where I really, really, if I wanted to select one, I would select the, the other one, the Me Malik, um, which is real close. It's Microsoft Research, so it's, it's a feature, not a bug, I suppose. Um, <laughs> So let's see, so anyway, standard malloc again, super, these, all these others, but we got down 42% speed increase, which, which like amazed me that 
and I, and, I, and I checked, you know, I checked all the uh, output files, and yeah, they, they were right. They were the same as the originals within certain parameters. Um, but I was really impressed that this would actually work so well. So here's my little chart, which is hard to read. Down at the bottom, we have the original compile and all the way up to the top where we ended up. That looks pretty good, huh? Yeah. Now, I want to emphasize, of course, that, I mean, nothing I've been speaking about here is, is specifically Zeek related, right? I mean, this is, Zeek was the focus of my, my uh, analysis here, but actually there's tons of software out there that could benefit from this same methodology. So, where, where are we at? Let's see. So the next steps, other, other libraries may benefit. I mean, there's, there's other libraries, obviously, that are linked in that could be compiled. Um, I had another idea, I, you know, I had another idea at like 2 a.m. last night, but I just, you ever get those, you know, things just, oh, I gotta get some sleep, I gotta do a presentation tomorrow. So, but anyway, there's probably more things that can be done. So let's see, here I am at the end. Your mileage may vary. I suggest trying it against both your traffic, against PCAPs, against the network, um, running it against, I found it was kind of interesting, to, there's a lot of PCAPs in the Zeek distro and that'll allow you to exercise code paths that might not otherwise be exercised. Alternatives to standard libraries, in my case I was checking out malloc, but there's probably a lot of others that could be done. Um, and profiling the code to find out you know, what the hotspots are could probably help with that. And so with that, I will take any questions. Anyone have any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Right. Well, okay. That's uh, th th that's a good question. Um, is it the same? Is it the same PCAP I'm using? And the answer is yes. And of course, what that what that tells you is that that is the maximum possible that you could get because it's it, it's training against the input you're going to give it. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily get that that speed increase um, in a normal case. But good question. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. In the back. Excuse me? When you recompiled Malik, how did you, how did you profile Malik? Oh, okay. So how did I profile? So, so you, compile, you compile the Malik library the same way. Um, and I was using LD preload to load, to, to, to load that in to the, to the Zeek binary. And um, if, if you do it the same, it'll do the same thing. It'll, it'll actually drop the, the statistics into the build tree that you built the Malik library in. And then you can use that to rebuild it. So, so I and I and it was all built against that same 150 gig file. Does that does that make sense? I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, then I want to thank you all for uh, your time.